Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet sallallahu about plagues. And the Prophet sallallahu said that plagues are a punishment that Allah sends to whomever he pleases. And Allah has made it a means of mercy for the believers. It is a punishment to some and a mercy for the others who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That no one stays at a place of plague and expects Allah to reward him and knows that nothing will happen except what Allah has decreed, except that he shall get the reward of a shaheed. This is in Sahih Bukhari. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hadith is Mutafaq Ali Bukhari Muslim. The plague is considered a shahada for every believer. So the plague is a mechanism for shahada. Now the context of Amwas in particular, uh, Ta'un Amwas, which is the plague that I'm going to talk about inshallah ta'ala. It's actually narrated at an interesting time from the Prophet Sallallahu So the Prophet Sallallahu did not live to see this plague, but he prophesied it. So Awf ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, I went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during Ghazwa Tabuk, Battle of Tabuk, and he was sitting in a leather tent alayhi salatu wasalam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sitting in his tent. And it's really interesting what he says. Count six things. Six things between I and the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ said, the first one, Mauti, my death. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Thumma Fathu Bayt al Maqdis. And then the conquest of Jerusalem. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Thumma Mautan Ya'khudu Fikum Yaku'asil Ghanam. The Prophet ﷺ said, and then after that, a plague that will afflict you and kill you in great numbers, just like a plague that would run through sheep. The Prophet ﷺ said that that would be the third thing. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, and I'll mention the other three just to finish the hadith. He said that you would have an increase of wealth to such an extent that even if one is given a hundred dinars, he would not be satisfied. So wealth comes upon the ummah. The ummah experiences a great period of wealth. Then he said وسلم, an affliction, a fitna that no household, Arab household would escape. And then he said وسلم, a truce between you and Ben al-Asfa, which are the Byzantines, the Romans, who will betray you and attack you under 80 flags. Under each flag will be 12,000 soldiers. So the implication is that the Roman Empire would not be the traditional Roman Empire. It would break into nations and different flags, and those nations would gather against you. After you had a peace with them, they would gather against you. And you can kind of understand now why the Sahaba thought the Day of Judgment was in their time. Like if you think, the Day of Judgment is around the corner and imminent. First of all, every generation of Muslims thought that. And the Sahaba themselves really thought that they were going to experience Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Why? The Prophet Sallallahu death was in what year? 633. And then, literally in order, Fatih Bayt Al-Maqdis, the opening of Jerusalem, was in the year 637. Okay? So just a few years pass, and then you have the opening of Jerusalem, and then you have the plague that the Prophet ﷺ was talking about of Amwas, Ta'un Amwas, which was the year 639. And the town of Amwas is a town in Palestine. It's only about 25 miles historically away from Jerusalem. So you've seen three of the six signs pass just like that in a matter of a few years. So if you feel as you're kind of watching everything happening in the world today, and you're like, it must be Yawm Al-Qiyamah coming around the corner, SubhanAllah, imagine if you lived in that time. So let's get to this plague, 639 in the town of Amwas. The Khilafah is the Khilafah of who? Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Muslims had just entered into Jerusalem. They just settled Al-Quds. They of course were expanding in Asham in greater Syria at the time and actively obviously at war with elements of the Roman Empire, with the Byzantines at the time. And suddenly this plague breaks out. Sta'un breaks out, right? The earliest Muslims, some of the earliest Muslims would die in this plague. In this plague, it would be about 25,000 people uh, that would die in Ta'un Amwas. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu heard about it and Umar radiallahu anhu decided to make his way over to Asham uh, to be with his people. Umar radiallahu anhu was a man who if the people were suffering, he wanted to suffer with them. He said, How could I claim to be a shepherd of my flock? And I'm not touched with what they are touched with. So I have to go struggle with them. I've got to go strive with them. So he intended to go there and to fight it himself. As he was about to enter, some of the Sahaba came to meet him. And it was typical that the generals would come out to meet the Khalifa before he enters anyway, right? To sort of inform him about the situation as is taking place. Abu Ubaidah al Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala anhu was of course the leader at that time. He came out to Umar radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu asked him about the situation. Abu Ubaidah said, 
we are falling like sheep. Using the same language of the Prophet ﷺ, people are dying right and left. And this was the first time the Sahaba had ever encountered uh, something of this sort. So Umar anhu started to take shura from the people. He started to consult from them about what his next step should be. Some of them told Umar anhu, you should return to Medina with your core because you should not be struck with what they are struck. That, you know, it's catastrophic as it is, but if you die from this, and if the people that you came with die from this, then that spells doom for the ummah, right? That has much greater implications for the entire ummah. So you have not yet entered, go back to Medina, take those that are with you, and don't get touched by this. Some of the Sahaba told Umar anhu, tawakkal ala Allah, trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you should come in and you should fight this uh, with the people, they need to see uh, that leadership. Most of the people told Umar anhu, it's important for you to go back to Medina. And if even if you survive this, then you might take some of its effects back to Medina and imagine this spreading through Medina as well, right? Think about the discussions that they're having, right? With what's available to them at the time. So Umar who listened to, the, to them, and when the stakes were not just his health, but the stakes were the entire ummah, that this means that Medina could suffer, that the Khilafah could fall apart, that so much could happen. Umar who is obviously thinking about the survival of Islam, he's not thinking about himself. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, if that's the case, then we should go back. Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu says a very famous statement to him. He says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, atafirru min qadarillah. O commander of the believers, are you running away from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Law qalaha ghayruka ya Abu Ubaidah. I wish someone other than you would have said that, O Abu Ubaidah. Because he loves him so much, respects him so much, holds him in such high esteem, and so he hated to have that difference of opinion with Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu. And he had hoped that a statement like that would come from someone else. He said, نَفِرُّ مِنْ قَدَرِ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ قَدَرِ اللَّهِ We are fleeing from the decree of Allah to the decree of Allah. We're fleeing, we're running away from the decree of God to the decree of God. This is probably the most important lesson to seize from this entire thing, okay? Tawakkul, trust in Allah, is not foolishness. Trust in Allah is not recklessness. Trust in Allah is al-akhdu bil-asbab, to do your part and then put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To intentionally put yourself in harm's way. And by the way, this is for the grand and for the micro because some people really, really, really mess this concept up, okay? To put yourself in a position of harm or to not take harm seriously because you say it's okay. Allah Allah will take care of it, it's all right. That's not courage, that's not trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anything, you know, that is a means of, of showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your lack of wanting to do more, to keep yourself in a situation where you could do more to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no, this is not how it works in terms of tawakkul, in terms of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Umar is telling Abu Ubaidah, I'm doing my part. We're running away from the decree of Allah to the decree of Allah. We can't escape the decree of Allah no matter where we go. But Allah tells us to do our part to protect ourselves and to do what's best to avoid harm. And so that's why we're doing that. As Umar radiallahu anhu said that, Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu approached the gathering. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf had heard what the debate was about. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf said, I have some knowledge of this from the Prophet He said, I heard the Prophet say, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ بِطَّعُونَ بِأَرْضِ If you hear about, بِطَّعُونِ بِأَرْضِ If you hear that a plague has struck a land, فَلَا تَدْخُلُوهَا Then do not enter into that land. وَإِذَا وَقَعْ بِأَرْضٍ وَأَنْتُمْ بِهَا فَلَا تَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا And if it strikes a place and you are in it, then do not leave that place. So again, the Prophet ﷺ say, if you hear about the outbreak of a plague in a land and you're not in it, don't go to it. And if you are in a place where the plague strikes, don't leave it, right? What does that sound like? The word that's the key word, right? Quarantine, right? This idea of trying to contain the harm in one place as much as possible. Once Abdul Rahman ibn Awf said that, then it basically settled the debate. The Prophet ﷺ said it. Umar as he turns back to go to Medina. So Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu remained behind as things started to get worse in Palestine. He called for Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he asked him to look for a place that they could take those that are infected out immediately and put them in one place from the rest of the population. So now let's separate the population from the rest. Anyone that's sick, let's go ahead and separate them at this point. Abu Musa radiallahu anhu said, okay. He got home, Abu Musa went home that day and he found that his wife was struck with it. 
and the wife of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari died that same day radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa anhi. So then Abu Ubaid radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as Abu Musa was struck obviously with what just happened to his own household, Abu Ubaid radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he took his camel and he started to look himself for an area that he could quarantine some of that population, that he could put that population in. And just a few hours after that, Abu Ubaid radiallahu ta'ala anhu suddenly fell ill and he fell down and he looked like he was about to die too. The people came to him, they rushed to him as he was about to die. And he gave this beautiful nasiha, this beautiful advice to people as he was dying. He said, In Allah kataba ala bani Adam al maut Allah has written death upon the children of Adam, fa kulluhum mayitun, and so all of them will die. He said, فَأَعْقَلَهُمْ مَنْ كَانَ أَطْوَعْ لِرَبِّهِ وَأَعْمَلَ لِمَعَادِهِ He said, and so the smartest child of Adam is the one who is the most obedient to his Lord, وَأَعْمَلَ لِمَعَادِهِ and who has done most to prepare for their journey. Now when Umar anhu got back to Medina, he worried about Abu Ubaidah. He wanted Abu Ubaidah to come with him. So he wrote Abu Ubaidah anhu a message. He knew that if he told him, I'm worried about you come to Medina, Abu Ubaidah would say no. So he sent him an ambiguous message. He said to Abu Ubaidah, Inna li bika haja, I need you for something. And so when you receive this, فَإِذَا جَاءَكَ كِتَابِي هَذَا فَقْدِمْ عَلَيَّ once, once this letter of mine reaches you, come to me right away. So he left it kind of ambiguous. Abu Ubaidah read the letter, radiallahu anhu, um, in Palestine at the time, and he laughed. So he actually laughed when he read the letter, the people around him, because he knew what Umar was trying to do. He responded to Umar radiallahu anhu, and he says, Innani la arrabu an jundi, he said, I'm not going to leave my troops behind. And I'm satisfied with the decree of my Lord. And to die of this is shahad. So Umar anhu wanted to protect him. Abu Ubaidah knew that, even though Umar was intentionally ambiguous in the letter that he sent to him. So he said that it'll be shahad. Umar anhu was pacing in Medina, waiting for the letter to come back. Right? He wanted Abu Ubaidah to survive so badly. He loved him so much. And so it was either Abu Ubaidah that was going to come back or a letter that would come back. Instead, a letter came back. So Umar who took the letter, the Sahaba gathered around him. He read the letter and he wept, okay? He started to cry heavily. So much so that the people around him said, did Abu Ubaidah die? He said, no, but it's only gonna be a few days. There's no way he's gonna survive this, right? It's only a matter of a few days. And SubhanAllah, it was only a few, it was indeed sometime after that, the next letter that came was that Abu Ubaidah had passed away radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And before he died, he appointed Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu as the Amir of those people. Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he cried and he eulogized Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu and he said, Imra'an lillahi ameenan wa kana Allahu fi nafsihi azeema. That he was a man who was sincere, truthful to his Lord, trustworthy with his Lord. Wa kana Allahu fi nafsihi azeema. And Allah was great. In, or he perceived the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a special way, that he had a special reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, in him. When Umar radiallahu anhu found out that Abu Ubaidah died, if you want to know the significance of the death of Abu Ubaidah alone, okay? Some of you might remember, by the way, there's a narration where Umar radiallahu anhu had wished that he could have a whole room full of Abu Ubaidahs. Abu Ubaidah was not a replaceable person. And so when he passed away, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu wept and he said, Wallahi, this is significant. He said, if Abu Ubaidah was alive, I would have appointed him to be the Khalifa. And he said, and I would have met Allah in peace. For I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, every ummah has an Ameen, every ummah has a trust, has, has a trustworthy one. And the Ameen of this ummah is Abu Ubaidah. Was Umar a selfish person? Was Umar worried about himself? No, because when something similar struck Medina, Umar radiallahu anhu went out of his way to suffer the worst of what the people suffered, right? He didn't eat what people could not eat. People would bring him meat, he didn't take meat. He found his son carrying a piece of watermelon in the home. Umar radiallahu anhu said, no one's eating watermelon until the whole ummah can eat watermelon, even if he bought it from his own money. Right, we're all going to struggle together, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the people, should struggle the most of them. So Umar radiallahu anhu almost died in the drought that would strike Medina. In fact, subhanAllah, there's a beautiful statement from Umar radiallahu anhu that once he was sitting, he was so hungry, death was so imminent, he hadn't eaten for so long that his stomach was making noises. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he's tapped his stomach and he said, Qartir awla tu qartir, wallahi la tashba' hatta yashba' al-Muslimi. He said, you could growl or not growl, I swear you will not be filled until the Muslims eat. 
subhanAllah, disciplining himself. Like, I don't care how much I suffer, I will strive with the people. So that's Umar radiallahu anhu's way. Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, when he saw the death of Abu Ubaidah, he said that this is a mercy from your Lord, the prophecy of your Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that which has taken some of the righteous before you. And then he said, Oh Allah, let the family of Mu'adh get the biggest share of this mercy. It's a very strong dua. Why? Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, no sooner than him making that dua, Mu'adh radiallahu anhu's two daughters died, two sons and his spouse. His whole family died from the plague. Then Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu also passed away. Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu was appointed next as the Amir next. And Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu was, I mean, a strategist, right? He's also a person who is exceedingly talented in terms of war, in terms of battle and arranging armies and things of that sort. So Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu, very pragmatic, very smart, very strategically, he stood up and he said, Ayyuhan nas, O people, when these plagues uh, spread amongst the people, it's like fire. So he said, Let's, we should go to the high grounds away from the affected areas. And every family, instead of trying to quarantine the sick and then you can't keep up, Amr anhu said every group of people, or he split them up into groups of people in accordance with the way that he was analyzing them, stay in a tent. And he said, stop coming to any type of public place or any type of convening and get away from this town. So they went literally into the mountains and he set up the tents for these small, for the families to basically stay. And at that point, the, the plague had ended and no one else had passed away. So subhanAllah, some of them said the Sidq of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, that his family was the last to ingest that plague. And they all passed away as shuhada, as Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu had, had wished. So after Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu took the Sahaba, or took the people to the mountains, some time passed and no one else passed away from that plague. The last message is, let it be a reminder of the fragility of life and the inevitability of death. SubhanAllah, I mean, like if you think about the things that happen today, if you don't die from this, you die from that, right? Something very predictable, something unpredictable. Who knows what awaits you and how it awaits you, right? فَلَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ غَدَا no one knows what will happen tomorrow. No one knows what land they're going to die in. You don't know how or where you're going to die. You might as well use your life in a way that is beneficial and let these reminders trigger that longing for the hereafter and think the way that Abu Ubaidah said for us to think. 